Get ready for the ultimate Linux security experience. Introducing the TuxCare newsletter, a game changer for Linux enthusiasts and security conscious individuals. Prepare yourself for insider insights, breaking news on Linux vulnerabilities, and practical tips to optimize Linux usability. The TuxCare newsletter delivers all of this and more, curated by their team of Linux and open source professionals. Stay informed with expert analysis and actionable advice as TuxCare reveals emerging trends, software updates, and best practices to protect your digital life. As a subscriber, you'll gain exclusive access twice per month to info that will benefit you every day, 24-7. So, if you're Linux security focused and want cutting-edge content delivered directly to your inbox, sign up for the TuxCare newsletter today and join a community of informed and empowered digital citizens. So head over to lp.tuxcare.com slash barcode to subscribe to the TuxCare newsletter now. This is Barcode a cocktail-powered podcast that dives deep into the technology, personalities, criminals, and heroes that have come to define modern security across the globe. I'm Chris Glandon. Join me at the bar for an amazing story. The perilous nature of LLMs is like rolling dice, where every interaction carries the weight of uncertainty. LLMs thrive in a world of unpredictability, where unexpected interactions within a data set can be as devastating as rolling snake eyes. We're not talking about a minor setback here. We're talking about risks that have the potential to deal a losing blow. If you take that fateful gamble, you must realize the stakes are high and the losses can be crippling. But before I get into it, I need a beverage. And for this one, I'm pouring a dark, deep cocktail titled The Last Mechanical Art. It's hard-coated with 3 4 ounce mezcal, 3 4 ounce chinar, 3 4 ounce sweet vermouth, and 3 4 ounce Campari. Stir ingredients with ice and strain into a chilled coupe glass. If you're feeling lucky, garnish it with an orange twist. Alan Wood's story is one of transformation, resilience, and lifelong pursuit of knowledge. After serving in the British Army for 24 years where he specialized in Arctic warfare, and participated in multiple operations, Allen decided to pursue his passion for IT. He funded his own education and became a chartered member of the British Computer Society, establishing himself as a respected figure in the industry. Throughout his career, Allen has made significant contributions to the UK defense supply chain and logistics IT. He played a key role in developing the Ministry of Defense's health and safety information system and worked on various internal defense portals. Alan, welcome to Barcode. So please, talk us through your journey, my friend. You're the one who's best equipped to lead us down the path that you've traveled. Just as a by-the-by on career path, my LinkedIn by strapline is the Latin phrase. It stands for, how the hell did that happen? Which just about sums me up. I'm from Liverpool in the UK. I left school at 17 to join the army. In my army service, I did all manner of things. Um, The more sort of claims to military fame, I taught Arctic survival for a couple of years. Um, I did close protection for bomb disposal, which was, needless to say, a bit of an eye-opener. Around about the 15-year point, I decided to retrain. And this is about the uh, early to mid-80s. And I just happened to pick, it could have been anything, Um, I happened to pick IT. Um, I had a job in the city of Manchester. I did recruiting for a little while too. And it was one of the best jobs. But what was also happening was that PCs were beginning to proliferate. And it seemed to me a sensible thing to do to learn how to use these things. So basically what I did was I went to night school. And that turned due to uh, a very short course into something like nine years of night school study, um, learning about IT. And what I did, once I realized that I'd got the hang of it a little bit, I moved heaven and earth to get myself an IT job in the military. 
um, I ended up in what was called an, uh, a small systems group. And basically, a small systems group is was an organization of about uh, 30 people, um, IT experts, um, who were basically given free reign. Um, we were given free reign because nobody had a bloody clue what we were doing. There was also, coincidentally, a change in the way that budget allocation were carry, was carried out. And what that meant was that in the army headquarters I got posted to, uh, there were PCs all over the place and all kinds of people didn't know what, literally didn't know what to do with them. They were just boxes sat in a corner somewhere. Um, crusty old brigadiers would glare at them. Bright young lance corporals would leap all over them because that was what, what, what they could do. And I did that until I left the army in 1995. And I almost handed in my uniform before I was pulled back to go and work in defense logistics. And that was um, an eye-opener for all manner of reasons because it shifted me when I left the Army as a staff sergeant. But if you like, um, I ended up being, because I was one of the better qualified soldiers uh, in IT at the time, it lifted me several ranks. So the first job I got was um, uh, running, uh, writing software to run the Army's catering budget. And from there on in, it was the next 30 years of how the hell did that happen? And I ended up as what was called the IQB or the Independent Qualification Body on the RAF's Air Tanker Fleet when it was going through its transformation program. Basically, I was the bloke that signed off all the software to say it sort of worked. Um, that kind of thing. And um, one of the reasons to say all that is I think I was extremely lucky in that, first of all, I was in the posi right positions at the right time inside the Ministry of Defence, inside of my bit of the Ministry of Defence. Um, and a lot of things I did, I simply wouldn't be allowed to do now because it just wouldn't be allowed to happen that a single individual would, would be allowed to do those kinds of things. Um, and in between, I did, did all manner of things. It was it, When I look back, it's just bizarre. I retired three years ago, and at the moment, all I'm doing is Waldorf and Statler impressions on LinkedIn, throwing in the odd grenade when it sees fit, and seeing what the reaction is. Um, what I've tried to do over the last couple of years is to pass on some of the knowledge, because the way I see it is a lot of the mistakes and errors that are being made now are the kind of things I was making 30 years ago. Nothing changes. Um, so as a consequence, when I post on LinkedIn, I tend to post documents, offer them up. Um, they're on a pathfinder, not gospel basis. In other words, this is what I did. Please think about it. Um, make your own decisions. But I try to provide evidence that what I, of what I did that actually worked. And that seems to go down reasonably well, I think. You received recognition as a programmer as well, correct? Yeah, in 2010, I was um, uh, one of the, uh, I can say for about five and a half seconds, I was one of the top 10 programmers in the UK um, because I entered um, uh, uh, the British Computer Society's Developer of the Year Awards. Um, I only entered on spec. I didn't expect to get anywhere. And I got to the final 10. Um, one of the things I'm very keen on now with hindsight is that I made a point of applying for British membership of the British Computer Society. And the reason for that is they are the, they're, they're the, the premier professional body in the UK to do with IT. And I ended up a chartered member. And for a little while, I sat on the board that interviews people for chartered member status, that kind of thing. Um, the reason for suggesting that joining that kind of body makes sense is because it gave me a means to plan how I was going to improve my level of qualification um, because they have a, a, a continuous professional development scheme. They have a set of, they accredit university courses and all that kind of stuff. So it was a case of trying to formalize what I'd learned in a somewhat ad hoc way. So Alan, would you say that through the education that you've received, there's a balance between formalized education being in classrooms 
versus independently learning on your own and traveling down rabbit holes? Oh, yes. I think everybody who's ever written software has had those three o'clock in the morning moments where you come across something and you can't figure it out. And then you go to bed and at three o'clock in the morning, your eyes burst open, you leap off into the ceiling, you scrabble around trying to find a pen and you write it down and all the rest of it. Everyone will have gone through that. And at my age, at 69, trust me, that never stops. Um, but it was a case of, uh, if I may, I'll tell you a bit of a war story uh, about a job that I was given um, because this job led to me changing the way I used to think about the way IT worked. And when I was in um, the small systems group I mentioned, uh, I took part in an exercise to de develop software to manage uh, what are called small tools. In other words, the hammers and spanners that repair units in the army get issued with to, so that they can repair equipment in the field. Now, at the time, the army was very big um, and it turned into quite a massive database. But basically what it did was, if you were a tank regiment, it contained the scaling of the tools that you'd use to repair tanks. If you were in an infantry battalion, the scaling of tools to re, uh, repair infantry kit, because it's all different, all different scalings and issues. But it's basically hammers and spanners. Well, one day I was asked if I could link the database that we'd built as a team of three, but I was asked to do this by myself, um, to the relevant manpower planning bit of the cap badge I was in. Um, it took a little while to do it, but I managed to do it. Now to vital curiosity, I printed off a report of the two databases joined up. And it was in the old days of fly paper and all the rest of it. And this report, when it came out, was about uh, 10 inches thick. And I thought, well, let's have a look first. So I started looking through. Um, and I got to a couple of pages and I thought, oops, this shouldn't be printed. I took it to the colonel who asked me to do the job. I showed him the page and I said, please, sir, don't ask me to do that again ever. And he gave me one of those looks that colonels have a habit of giving staff sergeants who turn around and say things like that. He looked at the page and then he promptly picked the report up and shredded it. Because what it had done, it had joined up the manpower planning and the equipment planning for the technical repair arm of the army across all units. Um, and the implications of that, just joining up hammers and spanners against you should have 10 vehicle mechanics and that kind of thing, uh, opened an eye because I've been trained formally to do normalization and that kind of thing is part of database design. But connecting databases up, and when that happened, I thought, wow, this is, this is cool. This is really, really, really useful. Um, I didn't at the time have the means to explain or understand it, um, and nowadays I'd use terms like the application of graph theory to explain it. But the nature, when you combine a couple of databases together, then that changes the, 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 the nature of the information and the value of the information considerably. And that was my first inkling way back in about 1994. Um, and I spent a lot of time then, um, because I was still doing my formal IT training as per the um, the, the British Computer Society, and then started to study other things because there was something going on that I couldn't, I could see going on, but I didn't know how to explain. Yeah, it's the issue of having sufficient vocabulary and grammar to describe what's happening, which seems is what is happening currently with ChatGPT and LLMs. Everyone is trying to figure out how to describe the current state of affairs. Many of us have some vocabulary, but few of us have it all or enough. To be honest, that's exactly what I found about, because uh, you. I, hopefully you'll have seen the briefing note I put out about the nature of chat GBP. The reason for that is, is it was to put all information about it that I could gather in one place. And that's a habit I've developed over the years too. Because as you are well aware, what happens is something comes along, everyone goes, wow! And then they start playing with it without figuring out what the bloody thing does. Um, so I decided um, to, to get all of these things together. And what I found was that this was another extension of me knowing what they were doing, but not really knowing how to explain it. Um, and again, it all comes back to this idea of the nature of relationships between things. Right. And once you begin to understand those connections, I think it changes the perspective. 
for me, it's it's mind blowing. The one word I I uh, use on one of the documents I've produced is a set of schematics, architectural schematics. But one word I use is cybernetics. Now, cybernetics is nominally the science of communication, but uh, if you go back into um, hit the history of it, I just think it's absolutely stunning. I I um, it, unfortunately it's full of scientists with mad sounding German names and that kind of thing. So I came across a book called Introduction to Cybernetics by um, Ludwig von Bertenalfi. Now it was written about I guess in the sixties or something. But in it, what it does is it describes the the nature of a system, but it puts it in the in the idea of a biological thing or biological things. And in it, it describes a series of observational experiments on a dog. And I I I I'm very wary of trying to explain this because I'm not good enough to explain it because it sounds absolutely bonkers. But basically. The, what he did was he watched the nature of food intake of a dog with the aim of establishing a relationship between the skin of the dog, food intake, and waste out. And what it works out to is that the dog's skin grows at a precisely the right rate to cover the dog. Now, that sounds obvious, but when you think about it as a system of something that is growing and changing with the way food comes in and converts it into whatever it is it's doing inside that body, it's absolutely amazing. And it's a case of uh, that led on to other books. So there's a guy called um, Maturana, Humberto Maturana. His essays on cognition and autopoiesis, they are just stunning. And that led me to a guy called Stafford Beer, and Stafford Beer is an interesting cove because he annoyed in the Cold War, he annoyed everybody in the American security services because he was running Chile on the back of a computer. But his books, Brain of the Firm and the Heart of the Enterprise, they are not easy reads, not by any stretch of the imagination, but they are for me, they, they just were, because what it did was it gave me the means to explain my kernel and the two databases and how things are linked in multiple ways. Uh, the issue then is not so much um, that the links are there, but how you get at them and how you can exploit them. And once you do that, it, it just, for me anyway, it just changed the way I went about writing software. If we continue on that for a second, there's a lot of developers or cybersecurity engineers that may be overhearing this conversation at the bar. Listening to the analysis of the physical world, the virtual world, and cybernetics, what is something that you were able to incorporate into your regular occurrence practices as a software developer that would be worth sharing for other developers that are just entering the software development field or may not have 30 years of experience? Well, okay, let, let me be uh, politely blunt. If I had my way and I was in a position and the authority to do it, I would make everybody who wants to learn uh, how to code do some cybernetic study before they're allowed anywhere near a compiler. I would make them do training beforehand because one of the there are a number of I've learned over the years a number of um, uh, mistakes or misunderstandings in software generally that just don't seem to go away. One of them is the use of the word system because unfortunately the 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 word system tends to apply be applied to a software product any product. But it is not the system. The system is the organization as a thing. And the software must support the nature of the delivery of the business. Anything else is just idle flimflam, which incidentally is one of the reasons I have reservations about LLMs. But if you accept that the organization is the system, then a key on the key need to thing to understand is the nature of the form, function, and purpose of the system because that drives the need for the information and the need to know. Now, uh, if I may, another book that uh, I I was I was basically beaten about the head and told to read by uh, an ex, an old, an honourable IBMer, um, Living Systems by James Greer Miller. It's quite rare. 
It was written a long time ago. Um, it's very expensive. But when I got my copy, I read uh, a little bit about his concept of fray out. And I thought, wow, boom, bang, wallop. That's exactly what goes on. And the way to try and explain fray, uh, fray out that I prefer to use is that my boss's boss doesn't want the same kind of report as I do. And my boss doesn't want the same kind of report. But whatever you do with information management has got to meet all those three requirements and get data collection right. And it's another extension of this idea of the organization as a living thing. Um, because if you look at a way, an organization um, taking the average Fortune 500 company, the life of the average Fortune 500 company is only about 30 or 40 years, apparently. And decreasing rapidly. And oddly enough, they've decreased rapidly in clumps. This is the argument that our technological-based economy is actually stuck in a low equilibrium state. I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Um, I think there's only about, uh, I used to have the names of them, but there's only about three companies from when the uh, New York Stock Exchange founded that are still there. Um, everything else has gone, died, and all the rest of it. So what that means is these systems, these organizations, have a life cycle. And the data collection and information delivery requirement changes as the organization matures. So what I've found over the years is that, again, coming back to gain the vocabulary of what a, dis a, a system is, I've learned an awful lot of things that are not really to do with coding per se. And it's trying to grasp and understand the nature of the system. Now, if I may, I'll tell you another little war story. I had a job um, which was to do with establishing proof of concept of proving supply chain performance. Um, as you can imagine, a defense supply chain is, if you like, a, a, micro, a microcosm of an ec economy because everything is in there, vehicles, uh, black plastic bags, you name it, is in the inventory somewhere. They can ask for it because they need it. Now, um, at the time, there were the, the Royal Navy was just commissioning two major warships. Um, what happens with when that happens uh, is they have a, um, a commissioning day, and on commissioning day, on that day, the warship being taken into service must be complete to, to equipment schedule. In other words, everything must be there. Two seconds after, it all goes to rats because things break and all that kind of thing. But on that day, it must be there as a complete warship so the Navy takes it on. Well, a very senior person issued an order to the effect that no matter what happens, the entire supply chain or the supply chain will make absolutely bloody certain on that day that warship will go out complete. Well, it was a big ship. Three or 4,000 miles away in the Persian Gulf on anti-pirate duty, there was a sailor in a warship who read that order and thought, I'll have some of that, because he didn't give a stuff, really, about the admiral in London who wanted his warship commissioned and sailing off on the day. What he cared about was his warship, because he was on it. So what happened was, because he was fully operational, he had a high demand priority anyway. In other words, he could request stores quickly, and he would get it. Um, but then he used this super-duper code, and that changed entirely so that they're pretty much for whenever he asked for anything, the entire defense of the UK, it seemed, would concentrate on getting the stuff out to this bloke on his ship. Well, what that meant was a C-17 flying out to Bahrain would have a priority space would be given to this one bloody warship. It would be flown out to Bahrain and then got out to the warship in the fastest way possible. Now, you'd expect that for missiles and radar and all that kind of thing. But this sailor was demanding things like soap powder, um, all the niff-naff and trivia of running a, running a warship. Nobody doing anything wrong, but the nature of the system allowed that kind of thing to happen when it really shouldn't have, all on the, uh, the, the let's call it, interpretation of an order that wasn't written particularly well. Well, two naval warrant officers... And in any military, old, crusty naval warrant officers are not people you argue with. 
it's a one-sided discussion, mostly yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir, came to me and said, uh, can you detect this? We think it's going on, but we don't know how. And I did. I showed them because you could see literally on the graph I plotted, there was a nice little straight line. Then this order comes out and the line went through the roof. The subsequent conversation between the headquarters was in and the warship was an absolute scream because you got, um, no, we're not doing it. Yes, you are. No, we're not. Yes, you are. No, we're not. Look, here's the chart. Silence. And then a message came back about 12 hours later saying, um, we found out what the problem is. It won't happen again. And they had visions of this young sailor being chucked over the ship and dragged through the ocean for a couple of hours to make sure he didn't do it. But again, that comes down to the nature of um, you can detect these things if you have access to the data and you have a different way of looking at the nature of a system because the system isn't just a database. It's the whole shooting match. That would be termed a complex socio-technical system. What a great story. And indeed, that enterprising young man may have faced some challenges and obstacles along the way. In any case, let's refocus on LLMs and ChatGPT because it is the flavor of the moment and exhibits many of these things. The fact of the matter is particularly that your diagnosis of the risk and innovation state is limited to your mental models. If your mental models aren't large enough, you're not going to be counting A, the risks, but also all of the innovation opportunities. I'd be a bit more cautious than that. Um, as I've learned and studied, I really do not think, if I was any involved in anything to do with trying to exploit an LLM, I wouldn't do it with the kind of model that ChatGBT is. Um, and there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, first of all, um, I understand the nature of the technology and the technique, and I think it's clever. I, I've done some experiments in exploitation of unstructured data or documents. And the use of words can be extraordinarily useful as a means of identifying how to link things together. It, it, it is staggering. I can wax lyrical about that for ages. But basically it goes like this for me. I did an exercise in uh, due diligence of examining terms and conditions and nature of business and all the rest. Um, and that taught me one thing. Um, you go into the, any of these tools blind, then somewhere along the way, it's going to cost you a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of effort, and that will rise exponentially unless you understand where things come from. So there were a couple of key papers. One of them was by Stephen Wolfram, who pointed out the idea that a language model does not do math because it's not trained. It, it isn't meant to do math. That's a whole totally different sphere of activity. Um, there was another one that explained where the data came from. Now, for all of my life, uh, working life in IT, the one thing, the one constant has been GIGO. The one thing you must make sure of, because anything that comes out of a computer screen tends to be taken as gospel no matter what happens, is that whatever you present is accurate has been properly validated and can be verified as being properly validated. Okay. If you can't do that, then the bottom line is if it all goes belly up, then you cannot defend yourself from the things you've done. The things you produce are accurate. Now, the half a dozen major data sets that the open AI guys used quite reasonably, quite sensibly. One of them is something called the common crawl which is a, uh, you'll all be aware of things like the Google, Google dance and all that kind of thing where Google's cataloging stuff. Well, somebody's just done the same kind of thing, but made it open source and available to anyone who wants to use it. Another is Wikipedia. And then you have a couple of online book libraries. One's the uh, Gutenberg project and another one is a thing called the uh, bibliotech. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but it's it's a it's an online book library. Now, I have a number of problems with the common crawl because and Wikipedia, and the reason is that they are both uh, the web is changing every five, every every millisecond. Somebody's typing something in there somewhere. 
So as a consequence, the common crawl cannot be uh, up to date and accurate because the common crawl just simply physically cannot be done uh, sufficiently robustly. And the same applies to Wikipedia. And if you look on any Wikipedia page, then what you have is a little note to the effect that if you think this is wrong, um, sign up to be an editor, write in, and you can change it. Um, now, that implies too, and I, I was a, a Wikipedia editor for a little while, that it too is subject to uh, comprehensive and entirely random change, not out of any malicious intent, but because people want to make it better, which is fine. Now, you then take a data set over which you have no control, which cannot be ever uh, completely accurate, and you only use part of it, because in chat GP, uh, for, for chat GPT, the data will stop being lifted at uh, 2021, I think. Now, that means the data is, is out of date. Now that for me is anathema. You don't, you just don't do that. You go to great lengths to make sure that your data is complete and verified and validated and all that kind of stuff. Now, that's the the, the principal mistake um, in that they've tried to produce something akin to a Babel fish, um, all things to all men. Um, it might have been better to pick something a specific area and concentrate on it. It wouldn't matter what it is, it doesn't matter, but to prove the concept and make sure it works. Because the way the data is, they cannot prove that the data is accurate, that the, whatever the response is, they can't prove it's accurate because they, can't, they have no control over the source data. It then goes through the um, transformation stages and all the rest of it, and out of it you get a bunch of tokens. Now... Uh, coming back to cybernetics and the nature of relationships between things, uh, another book uh, called Network Science by uh, Barabasi, his name is, absolute gem. Um, if you want to understand graph theory, there's no doubt about that in my mind. Another one called Linked. Um, one of the things uh, you'll have heard of six degrees of separation. Oh, yeah. The principle is that if you start off with uh, me, Say and I could, I should in principle be able to apply uh, identify a relationship between me and any of you guys within about six links. Well, Barabasi worked out I think that it was about nineteen or something, and nineteen makes sense when you take in everything out. You take in the, the the nature of network science and all the rest of it. But what that means is that you have potentially in any data set. Many, 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 many thousands of relationships, millions and billions of them that are there to exploit if you know how to exploit them. Okay? And that's why the story about the sailor on the warship and all the rest is, because uh, if you don't know, if you, these things happen and they are recorded somewhere or another, but unless you know how to exploit the nature of relationships, then actually you'll never know that these things are going on and you won't be able to prove it, yada, yada, yada. So it's a case of, I, I might, I'll, I will have the numbers wrong, but it's been changed. It's been trained in ninety-five languages. Um, it doesn't do Scouse, by the way. Um, ninety-five languages. Um, all of the words in those languages and all the rest of it, and then out of it comes a, sh a dictionary and a shed load of tokens that they run probability tests on. It's that kind of thing. Now, again, just taking me as an example, um, if you look up the name Alan Woods on the web, what you'll find is, uh, I'll be in there somewhere, no doubt, but there will also be an awful lot of Alan Woodses all doing their own thing all their own way. Well, if you only have, say, two tokens, uh, two, letters, two words in the dictionary describe my name, Alan and Woods, then actually the links that come out from that could be any one of those other Alan Woodses doing whatever it is those other Alan Woodses are doing. And unless you can prove accurately, first of all, that you've got the right Alan Woods and you've got all the right connections, then it all starts to go to a little bit, uh, a little bit to nonsense then uh, at, at that point. Um, they use the word hallucination um, 
to describe that kind of thing. Um, and a manifestation of that is the case in Australia where someone's suing them for def- apparently uh, lodged a complaint of defamation. So again, it's it, but what that means then is if you understand the nature of the complexity of relationships, that the models are structurally fragile, no matter what they do or how they do it, because they are so bloody big. I think there's billions of tokens or whatever it is. The issue is large amounts of unexpected interactions within the data set or within the data portfolio. And those interactions actually, in some situations, can be completely catastrophic. Not just bad and unfavorable, but completely deadly in a sense to some parts of the enterprise. It's risky rolling dice. The thing is, if you roll a dice, you've only got however many combinations of spots on the dice. True. Although it could be 20,000 sided though. (laughs) Yeah, I suppose. But with this thing, you've got however many words in the English language plus however many words are in whatever other languages and all the rest, all of that going on as well. It's just too big, too cumbersome. And when you then turn around and uh, you then think through about the nature of any retraining effort, which must happen quite frequently, then actually it starts getting more and more uh, structurally fragile as far as I can see it. So whilst I think it is definitely clever to be able to string a sentence together, and be reasonably accurate a lot of the time, the nature of the changing relationships between words. I mean, they wouldn't do teenager, for instance. I mean, it, when I talk to my granddaughter, we're on different planets. We're using the right words, but on not quite the right order. Um, it, it is a matter of uh, the, the nuances of language go way beyond just stringing a sentence together. And I think that's starting to become apparent. Having said that, um, I've been thinking about ways that I would use it. Um, And again, it's a matter of if you take a big legal case. um, So, for instance, I'm aware of uh, that there was an explosion in the Gulf uh, a few years back. And that case generated, I think, a library of about 10 million documents. Now, if I had the money, the wherewithal, and all the rest to fire those 10 million documents into an LMM, that is the kind of way I would use it. But as to handle general inquiries and gossip and all the rest of it, I wouldn't go near it. I hear you, man. I flippantly use the word, this stuff's on spliffs, to describe it. Because it gets things right enough to make people think it's right. But what it's also is, as far as I can see, separated from the source data, which it doesn't own anyway. So as a consequence, when this stuff comes out, there is no way that you can prove any relationship between the the, the sort of keywords and the key detail to make sure they're accurate, which is why you're getting things like people being declared dead and what have you. Yeah, it's almost functioning as an opinion aggregator. I mean, you're asking for an opinion but essentially you're receiving a mass amount of opinions in return. It's not a system to rely on as a source of truth. That's the difficulty. And if I may, um, there is a case in the UK called the post office horizon case. And if I was to ask or plead with anybody watching this to do anything, it would be go to go over to the post office horizon inquiry and just sit and watch the evidence. The reason for that is something like this. Um, The UK Post Office commissioned a platform to handle financial transactions of various bits and pieces called Horizon. Um, It was written a long time ago. It was distributed to the post offices, and a a post office like a post office in the US and what have you, um, to basically record details of all of their transactions. Now, um, when you begin to find out about it, you, you just look at it and you go, this was never going to work because it was 60,000 terminals um, on Windows NT4, yada, 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 and set live within an instant, uh, for want of a better phrase. I'm being a bit flippant here, but it was set live fairly, very quickly. Now, what happened was, for whatever reason, accounting errors started coming up and 
the accounting errors were blamed on the postmasters who were obliged to pay the money back. Okay, it's just the way the post office did business. Well, roll on uh, 20 years, and I think I'm right in saying there was at least one suicide. Uh, a number of people were jailed, n number of bankruptcies and all the rest, all because of this Duff system. And the Duff system was believed on the basis of whatever comes out of a computer screen must be right because computers are not capable of lying. Well, they're not capable of lying, but like I said, they're on spliffs a lot of the time. It is a case of um, people who write the software are people like me, are people like you guys, and we are not infallible, not by any stretch of the imagination. Now, um, the inquiry has got vid visual, there's people being interviewed and all the rest of it. Um, I got in touch with a couple of the guys who did the forensic review of it, um, and I was, I asked them some questions first, told them what I think, and I wasn't that far out from what they found, just going to ask some questions. They sent me some documents. Um, and you can just see that a massively distributed system with multiple versions being deployed on multiple kinds of machines was almost certainly bound to go belly up for no other reason than so many other things were going on. But again, it comes back to the perception of what comes out of computer screen. You, you, you cannot, uh, the ability of people to ignore everything that screams out this is wrong coming out of a computer screen, it needs to be, um, it, it, it's just astounding to me. What made it worse was that the legal profession um, were effectively, at the time, I think I might be using the wrong kind of word, but were mandated to believe computer evidence above anything else. And as a consequence, um, the, the, um, the reaction for the postmasters was always, you, know, you are guilty of making a mistake and what have you, you are guilty of fraud and all that kind of thing, when that just simply wasn't the case. And as far as I'm concerned, the major difficulty with the likes of an LLM, given the nature of the data that they don't own, that is not complete, yada, 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 is pretty much the same thing. People will just believe things coming out of a computer screen. Yeah, we call that loss of ground truth. It's when you no longer know if you're standing on the bottom of whatever it is. If you don't know that, you're in deep shit. That's right. The worst thing about an LMM is it's based on probability testing rather than hard evidence. In other words, uh, it, will, it will get it wrong. It's basically rolling a percentile dice against a range every time you open it. If you have a fixed corpus of information or 10 million documents associated to the big explosion, and you can corral it, you're relatively safe. Because with the number of probabilistic tests against that corpus, the corpus is static and fixed. So the laws of probability will show you where the trends are. But in terms of where the base rates keep changing, now we have ChatGPT4, which is API connected. So it has eyes and ears now. So you have no idea of what you're actually testing against or what you're rolling against. And again, it's, um, I'll, I'll come back again to something else I was asked to do, which was to, as a matter of due diligence, review license terms and uh, terms and conditions. Now, uh, you go and review the top 20 systems, and they gave me a pile of license documents, and I had to go and read the things, um, line by bloody painful line. Now, what that exposed was uh, a number of things. And what follows is quite sensible. It makes business sense to do it. Um, but every single license term and condition I read was had uh, a number of things to do. The first was to protect the intellectual property rights of the supplier of the software. The second was to minimize their liability uh, uh, against any form of legislation whatsoever. And then to transfer responsibility to the end user of them using the computer and it was on, issued on the basis of a license in as much as you don't own any of the software, you don't own any of the documentation, um, you don't own any of the data designs because they're all mine. Now, that makes perfect, perfectly rational and business, business sensible and all the rest of it, but it is um, 
uh, a bit of a one-sided deal, I think. Now, again, it would, one of the companies that we looked at, we read something about them seeing license uh, policing as an interesting and exciting new revenue stream at the time. And we thought, hang on a minute, what's this all about? We didn't believe the article, but what we then did was we downloaded the company's concern, their financial reports for the previous five years, went through them because we were crusty old stroppy bloody ex warrant officers and all the rest of it. We'll go and check. And we went through their license terms and sure enough, you could see as the uh, revenue was broken down, license policing was becoming a rising, a, a budding star. Um, we were asked by one of them to, if we could, ex if they could execute an audit, an audit, we, uh, body swerved them like nobody's business and asked them to send us stuff to check for all kinds of reasons. They sent us various bits of scripts of what have you. And um, what they also did, albeit inadvertently, which took uh, advantage of a number of procedural disjoints to do with the acquisition of software. Um, and for a whole pile of reasons, um, any license infringement to do with that would up their prices, would they claw back additional money for additional licenses because you were using it because we could prove it on the audit. Now, another issue then coming back to LLMs, uh, one of the first things I did was I read carefully uh, the open AI terms and conditions. Um, if anybody was looking to use open, uh, the open AI things, I would make sure that they'd read paragraph seven and eight um, I think Shoshana Zuboff describes such things as sadistic. I think, for me, those terms are sadistic. And I would also read their license, their, their pricing mechanism. Now, again, accepting entirely the business of shifting responsibility and liability to as, as normal things, their pricing mechanism is based on the idea of a token. Well, that's great, except that What's a token? And if you're going to charge me per token, how many tokens am I going to need? Well, actually, you don't really know because you don't know what a token is. And probably most people have no idea how much documents they want to put in the thing in the first place. So that if you like, you're going in there blind, um, opening your wallet and say, um, yeah, go on, take it. Just take it what you like. And if you then, I was quite surprised, I, I looked at that and I thought, well, no, that can't be right. And then I started to read up about how much it costs to train a model, how long it takes to train a model. And the figures I've seen have all been in the six figure range uh, of dollars. Now, what that suggests to me is that going into this blind uh, is not smart. And to do it, you've got to have some idea of uh, why you're doing it, what the business advantage it brings, and the nature of the return on investment you like to see over the next, say, five years or something. I know it's difficult to predict going forward, but when you look at LLMs, it is an emerging technology. Alan, how do you see it evolving and impacting our society long term? I think it's impractical. Uh, there's, no, there's no other way to, for me to describe it. It is a matter of this. If you're a, a, a small to medium and you've got to use huge volumes of data to train the thing, an interesting little fact of the, the average small to medium is that its vocabulary is only 140,000 words or thereabouts because quite simply they don't produce the kind of documents um, in volume across such a wide range of subjects that something like the common crawl does. So for me, it's impractical. It's something that you do... Um, if there is a clear business advantage to you, then crack on. But you've got to have that, an idea of that. You've also got to accept the idea that those using these LL, that those making these LLMs will reserve the right to use your model because you're going to use it on their kit because you can't run it locally with you. Um, they reserve the right to use your model as they see fit, which ultimately is going to be to their business advantage. Now, you're based in Cumbria. For those unaware of its whereabouts, Cumbria is located on the Scottish-English border, and it's known for its breathtaking landscapes, including the Lake District National Park, 
picturesque lakes and rugged mountains. It's a popular destination for outdoor enthusiasts and nature lovers, offering a unique blend of tranquility and adventure. If you don't mind, describe the environment for those that may one day find themselves in your area of the world. I've just started up as a guide on Hadrian's Wall, um, and I think it's an absolute blast. It's basically what I do is I wander around doing like a sort of uh, here be dragons kind of voice, sounding authoritative about the way the fort works. It's uh, house its fort. It is absolutely fascinating. And when you get up there and you, I mean, the fort has no business being, and anybody in the right mind would not build a fort where they almost bought it until you get up on top of the hill and look around at what you can see for miles and miles and miles. And then again, it becomes a matter of, um, I, I bought a book, uh, like I, say, I mentioned about um, notes they found in another fort. And it made me chuckle that these book, these these uh, notes are written by soldiers of the time, and you get things like such and such and such and such for, submitted a travel claim for three goats, fourteen chickens, and all the rest of it. Um, you've got all that going on, and it just brings it so much to life, and it's just an absolute blast. If you ever come up my neck of the woods, uh, go and uh, go and have a, You've got to go and have a look at the wall. It, it just is fascinating. Sounds amazing. Now, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear about the thriving pub scene. We've got uh, the Howard Arms in Brampton. Um, we've got all kinds of pubs and bits and pieces. To be honest, where we live is, oh, sorry, it's mandatory to have a dog. Okay. Um, if you haven't got a dog, then no one will talk to you. It's really that simple. If you've got a dog, then you've got mates all over the place. That's what we found. But... Um, Carlisle is a is a uh, a lovely town that we've we've found really it's a uh, city Newcastle is an absolute blast um all of it within easy traveling distance pubs and all the rest you, you galore in in Newcastle and the same in Carlisle um ours is a small market town we have uh oh uh, outside our front door Bonnie Prince Charlie when he raided England marched down the road with a hundred pipers which probably explained why the English ran away. It, there's just stacks of little bits of history and all the rest of it all over the place. Um, there's a name, William Stout. Um, he was the king's executioner, shipped over from Hexham. And he had hang, hanging, drawing and quartering to a fine art. Um, let's just say he... I won't go into the gory details, but he, he had it down to a fine art. There's all that kind of thing that's that's around here and what have you, just waiting to be tripped over. Okay, Alan, I just heard last call here. If you opened a cybersecurity theme bar, what would the name be and what would your signature drink be called? Right, my signature drink would be my strap line. How the hell did that happen? Sounds like a shot to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least three stiff Irish whiskeys followed by uh, a, a Bacardi, a Coke and Bacardi. That's what I call it. That's when it turns into what the hell happened. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, who the hell cares? <laughs> yeah. oh, and, and as for the pub, I'd call it Here Be Dragons. Love it. Thanks, Alan, for stopping by Barcode, man. I truly appreciate it. Listeners, I urge you to seek out Alan on LinkedIn. Within his profile, you'll not only discover his captivating post that will hook your mind, but you'll unearth a treasure trove of his research. Alan is the ultimate pathfinder, fearlessly forging his own path and generously illuminating the way with his valuable findings. Embrace the opportunity to establish a connection with this extraordinary individual and embark on a transformative voyage of enlightenment together. Join us next time at Barcode, where we'll continue to explore the darkest and most adventurous corners of the world. Until then, enjoy your spirits and enjoy life.